Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Lyle P. from Georgia. Thank you. Thanks, Lyle. Hi, folks. My name is Lyle, and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> Thanks for having us here today. Um, I want to thank uh, Kevin and Annie for putting up with us uh, the last 11 days, and they've given us a beautiful place to stay, and Barbara doesn't want to go home tomorrow, so I'm leaving her. She likes it here, <clears throat> and she will now become Kevin and Annie's problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was uh, talking about uh, there hadn't been a day that's gone by in the last few days that uh, AA folks haven't taken us here, taken us there, <clears throat> and done it with a great deal of relish and joy. And, and it just blows me away when that happens. And um, I was telling Barbara, I said, you know, I hope when these folks come over to our country, we can do it just even as half as well as they've done it. It's just been a joy to be here, joy to be with everybody. And I said, told Barbara, I said, you know, it's not like we have certain people hosting us. <clears throat> I feel like everybody that we've been with has really become a good friend. And that's a touching a uh, joyful thing in this fellowship. And uh, we're talking the other day, and I said, you know, so many people feel sorry for us. You know, these, oh gosh, they got to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, or they belong to that dreadful group of AA. And I thought, if they only knew. And we were at a cookout yesterday, and the laughter and the joy and the fun was just incredible. And uh, something I couldn't have imagined when I first came here. Now, uh, I also want to sp- say a special welcome to newcomers. And I know we have two of them up here. I know their names. I'm not going to direct attention to them because I didn't want anybody looking at me when I first came here, but we're glad you're here. <clears throat> and we hope that you stay with us. This is a good program. This thing works. And I'll talk a little bit about my own personal experience with it as I get into this and the fact that I didn't know if it would or not. Uh, but I'm here to tell you it will. Some will stay. Some will go. Some will choose to get sober with us, and some will go back out, and some will die. I've watched 39 close friends die <clears throat> in the 19 years that I've been sober. And those are close friends. Uh, there's a lot more whose names I know. But uh, I look at this, I go, this is a gift. This sobriety thing is really a gift. It's not something I can work towards and accomplish and achieve. It's a gift. i got to do certain things to keep it, but I really appreciate it as a gift. <clears throat> so I want to thank all the folks who made our stay here so, so glorious. I'd call off the names, but as sure as I do, I'll miss somebody. So just please accept our thanks and, and our love for having us here and taking such good care of us. I'm supposed to get into this <clears throat> story thing, and I'll tell you that in the States, uh, we do AA different ways in different places, but uh, most of the time when speakers come to the microphone, they do several things, and I'll do that. Um, I'll tell you my sobriety date is March the 7th of 1990. Uh, I usually have three days that I talk about March 7th, 8th, and 9th every year. And every year that they roll by, even though it's been a few years since the original event, <clears throat> I relive with a great deal of intensity those things that happened because I can look at my watch and I know exactly where I was on any of those three days. And I know what was taking place. And I'm grateful that I have not had to repeat that. Uh, I'm going to start first, I think, with what happened. I mixed the order up a little bit. And I tell you that on March the 8th, 1990, in the United States, an event took place that um, had never before come to the public's attention, and that is three airline pilots were arrested for having flown drunk. They flew from Fargo, North Dakota, to the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and the arrest took place there, and it subsequently made the news media that went all over the world. May not have been, made a big splash over here, but it certainly did in the United States because it was a first of its kind. That's happened a number of times since then, <clears throat> but I've noticed uh, that they don't seem to quite get the coverage that I got. And uh, uh, this thing got on the news and it stayed, and I didn't think it was ever going to go away. I thought uh, 
From where I was, the way it felt, that perhaps Pearl Harbor might have gotten as much coverage, but I wasn't even sure about that at the time, and I didn't think it would ever go away. <clears throat> and um, when I landed at Minneapolis-St. Paul, one of the things that I also want to clear up real quick is that uh, I'm not an airline pilot who's an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic who, through a lot of good fortune, got to be an airline pilot and fly airplanes and live out dreams of my childhood. And that when I talk about being an airline pilot, it's really in the context of the story itself. That's all. I don't believe we come here with any pre uh, prestige or status. And I know we have people of all different walks of life in here. I don't care if you just came out from living under a bridge or you're in a homeless situation or if you're the CEO of a mega million dollar company. This, we all enjoy the same status here when we get here. And I think the highest that we ever rise to or achieve is that of sobriety. So I talk about it only because it's a part of the story, and that if I had been something other than an airline pilot, it wouldn't have made the papers, wouldn't have made the news, and I wouldn't have gone to prison for a, an offense that constituted a federal felony crime. Uh, having said that, I'll tell you that when I walked off the airplane on the morning of March the 8th and I saw airport police and FAA officials and Northwest Airlines Company officials, um, I knew that my life was over. <clears throat> Northwest Airlines at that time was the only major United States carrier that did not have quite an extensive program for alcoholic pilots. I may come as a shock to some of you who have a fear of flying, but <clears throat> today, I mean, at this point in time, there have been over 4,200 pilots restored that are recovering and flying in the cockpit. Some of us have retired. One of the leading doctors that I know said one time when I was listening to him, he said, when I get in the airplane, if the door is open, he said, I glance up there. And he said, if it's a face I'm familiar with or no, he said, I breathe a sigh of relief, and if it's not, I sit in the back and wonder. <clears throat> so I'm not the first one to ever have this experience. I was the first one that ever came to the public's attention. I spent uh, 12 hours that day, March the 8th, uh, in a very surreal, traumatic experience, sometimes feeling as though I was watching this happen as an out-of-body experience because this wasn't the way my life was supposed to go. This wasn't the way I had lived it, and this wasn't the way it was supposed to end. And I knew it was over because every five or six or seven years <laughs> at Northwest Airlines, some pilot would get in trouble with alcohol and they would be summarily dismissed, terminated, fired, and they never came back. And I knew the names of the pilots who had um, experienced that, and they were all up here, as they were with all of us, in this kind of mental hall of shame, um, having left in disgrace, and I thought, that's going to be my legacy. That's the way I leave here. And again, that was not the way I was supposed to have done it. It wasn't the way it was supposed to have been. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> we were detained for about 12 hours that day. And I just remember sitting there kind of vacillating between this out-of-body experience, thinking this just absolutely can't be happening to me, and the other times when I would sit around and i just almost get sick, thinking it is happening, it's happening right now, and I'm right in the middle of it. It was at one of the facilities where we gave blood that a reporter saw three uniformed airline pilots escorted by two, uh, police, two police officers, uh, and he thought there was a story there, and that's the way it broke. Now, I knew this story was going to sweep through the airlines like wildfire. They always did. And to me, it couldn't have been any worse than that. I had no idea at the time that it was going to put us on the front pages of all the newspapers the lead news story on all the TV sets, uh, both national and uh, less than, and it was going to stay on and stay on and stay on. <clears throat> I uh, was not able to get home that night. <clears throat> I was supposed to have been home that night and had not even had a chance to think about it because of the trauma of what was unfolding in front of me. And uh, got home the next day and had called Barbara and um she was still at the airport waiting for me in Atlanta, waited for four hours, and uh, I got off some message when I heard my voice on the answering machine, and all I could say was, there's been a disaster, 
I think I've lost my job and I'll be home on the first flight in the morning. <coughs> Pardon me. Fortunately, gratefully, she did not call me back. I don't know why, having just gotten a message like that, but I spent a sleepless night there in an apartment. I got home the next morning and uh, quickly made my way to the uh, head of the airport. I was still wearing my uniform. I knew that was the last time I would ever wear that. And I uh, saw Barbara parked out in the front of the airport and walked over and got in the car. I've never told a story, but what I didn't say that I was so ashamed and so humiliated, so already full of disgrace that I felt like I had to climb over the curb of the car to get in the car with her. And she and I had been married a long time, even at that point, and uh, I couldn't look at her. And as we pulled away from the curb, all I could do was just say, honey, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> and she said very softly, well, who better than I could understand how you feel right now? And we drove home in silence, and nobody talked. I didn't want to talk about this. And um, she went to work. And I went inside the house and I uh, did not want to be inside my skin. <clears throat> and I picked the phone up and I called a doctor who was a family therapist. He was the only doctor I knew at that point in time and uh, told him that there had been a real emergency, a disaster, and I needed to come in and see him. And I went in and um, I just told him straight out what had happened. I didn't mince any words. I just told him exactly what had just taken place and remember the look of <clears throat> real shock on his face and kept shaking his head and kept saying, God, Lyle, he said, this is just horrible. This is absolutely horrible. And he had started around his desk and he stopped and he looked at me. And there were two statements that would be made that day. Now, this is now <clears throat> March the 9th, which is Friday, the day after the arrest. And, uh, he looked at me and he said, uh, but maybe this is what had to happen. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea how that statement fit. He left and he came back a few minutes later and he said, um, I want you to go see another doctor. He said, this was a doctor I was on staff with at a hospital some years back. He said, he's a psychiatrist. He's a recovering alcoholic and cocaine addict. And he said, he's certified in addiction medicine. And I didn't, I'd never heard of addiction medicine, had no idea what that was. And he said, the appointment is for six o'clock tonight. <clears throat> and I thought, I, there's no doctor I know who sees patients on Fridays at six o'clock. So it, the message conveyed a certain sense of urgency to me. I, I knew that something, they, they were, somebody was really concerned about this. And later <clears throat> they told me, they said, we were concerned because your parents gave us pause to think that you might be a suicide. And I was absolutely emotionally shredded, completely destroyed. <clears throat> I don't, don't know what I looked like, but apparently they did, and they were concerned about it. And we went to the doctors, uh, drove clear across Atlanta, went in, and uh, he turned some lights on, and Barbara stayed outside. And uh, I have no memory of that meeting, none whatsoever. Uh, hadn't eaten or drank for two days. I simply don't remember the meeting. <clears throat> I know I was there. I don't remember anything he said to me. I don't remember any questions he really asked me, except that I remember that I was in such a state of t total, complete defeat that I gave him as straight an answer as I could to whatever question he asked me. I was as honest as I had the capacity to be at that point in time. And... Uh, the thing I do remember is at some point, wherever it was, he said to me, Lyle, he said, you're an alcoholic, and you need to get into treatment tonight. And I remember not having any feeling about that, and the reason that that registered is because I've always hated alcoholics. So uh, both my parents died from this disease and took it to the grave, and I saw what it did in the family, and I saw what it did in the Native American community I lived in, and I had a very small, narrow picture of what an alcoholic was and was not, <clears throat> and I had nothing but disgust and felt nothing but repugnant feelings towards these people that lay in the alleys and the doorways and drank out of brown paper bags, I thought, and stumbled around and took from society and never put anything back. And That was my picture of an alcoholic, and now he's suddenly telling me that I am one, and I didn't have a reaction to it. And I think that in the 24 hours... Perhaps since the arrest, 
I'd made some peace with that at a level that I wasn't even aware of. I think I knew. I knew that I had just lost uh, an entire life because I was drinking in a place at a time where I wasn't supposed to be, and it had cost me everything that I'd spent a lifetime working for. So I think that I knew that that must mean I'm an alcoholic. I said to him, I thought you'd tell me that, and I'm okay with it. But I said, I would like to, I said, please, let me go home tonight. I said, I'd like for Barbara to just hang on to me. I said, let my mind uncoil. Let me absorb what's happened. And I said, then I'll go into treatment. And he looked at me and said, you need to go into treatment tonight. And I looked at it as probably my first lesson in willingness. And I paused for a moment. And I, I said, okay. So he gave us directions back to a treatment center I knew nothing about and uh, had no reason to know anything about it. And we drove back across Atlanta following these directions to this treatment center. And one of the things that I really remember is making the final turn. It was in the dark, and the headlights swept a sign that was on the corner. This sign's no longer there now. But when the sign hit the lights on this, I mean, when the lights hit the sign on this, it was right in front of me, hit the brakes, and I stopped. And I sat and looked at this sign. I said, Anchor Hospital, Hospital for Alcoholism and Other Chemical Dependencies. And I just felt like somebody kicked me in the stomach. I just, I sat and I looked at this and I thought, this is how my life ends. 51 years old in a treatment center for alcoholics. You know, I couldn't understand how I had come to that. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And I had just a quick microsecond flashback of some of the, my life's accomplishments that I thought I was quite proud of and had given me an identity and reputation and things that I was, I thought had defined me. And, and it was all of a sudden like they were just gone, like maybe somebody had taken a giant eraser and they were gone. And, and uh, I remember I sat there and I felt like I had absolutely no value as a human being, no self-worth. I just didn't count. I had nothing going for me. And um, I eased off the brake and started down the hill into this treatment center, with clothes on my back. And uh, I thought all of a sudden, it was the first time that day, I thought, this is March the 9th. So this is my 27th wedding anniversary. And I said to Barbara, who was sitting on my right, I said, hell of a way to spend an anniversary, huh? <clears throat> and then I heard the second comment that I couldn't um, process that evening. And very softly, she said, it might be the best one we ever had. And I thought, who could think that? This is the deepest, darkest, most devastating moment of my life. There will be no comeback from this. How could anybody think that? You know, when I spoke at Winchester the other night, I paused. I'm going to do it again here, that lighten it up a little bit and tell you that uh, two years ago when we were having an anniversary, one of my sponsees came by, uh, just stopped in, didn't know he was coming over, and said, I want to wish you guys a happy anniversary. And we, I thought it was very nice. And he said, uh, kind of lightheartedly, he said, well, what's the secret to having staying married so long? And before I had a chance to say anything, Barbara said, well, I think it's mostly because I've never been able to admit I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so I know this is an ego-deflating program, and uh, <clears throat> I never have to worry about that. I get a chance to experience it every day. I'd like for Barbara to stand up, please. So this last March, we just celebrated number 46 together, and I, I get around the country a little bit, and I just happen to know that's a little bit longer than the average AA marriage. Uh, but, but as long as she doesn't get a program, I have to work on character defects, and can, we'll probably, I probably last it out a little bit longer. Anyway, we, uh, I drove on down the, uh, down the hill into the treatment center, and uh, I'll come back and try to pick up there in just a few minutes, but I'll tell you that. Um, 
get the first part of the thing out of the way and tell you that I was born in Wichita, Kansas in uh, September of 1938, which makes me 70 and a half. Um, Wichita, Kansas. Kansas is in the geographical middle of the uh, U.S. And I was, uh, I tell you my age, I do this usually every time too, because I like to know how old the speakers are. I always have my own little puzzling way of trying to figure it out. And, uh, <laughs> and by far the worst of the women that come up and speak, because they don't tell you usually, they drop little breadcrumbs of hints all over the hour that they're up here, and they talk about graduating from college the year after John Kennedy was assassinated. And, <laughs> Getting married when they were 23, which was the year after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon or something like that. And I'm sitting there trying to put all this together, and and I'm, sometimes I'm missing a lot of the message because I'm thinking, well, let's see, she was, by the time she's done, I'm thinking, well, I've got to narrow down to she's either 43 or 71. And, and so, so I'm thinking, she could, she could just save me a lot of time and trouble she did if they just tell me, so I just tell you, yeah. I was born in a very uh, blue-collar family. Um, you know, I hesitate to say we were poor. I think poor is subjective. I get around to a lot of the Indian reservations in the United States. If I'm on the reservation or either there in Canada, and I look at some of the homes that don't have running water or electricity, then by those standards, I was not poor. But we didn't have much. Everything we owned was secondhand, thirdhand. It was broken, patched, taped, wired. And we were always scrambling, always scrambling. And uh, I have no memories, really, of alcohol in the family until all of a sudden that's all I remember. And I know that that's a skewed perception. That's incorrect, but it's the way I remember it. And I remember um, really being pretty happy as a kid. We grew, I grew up in a, on an area southeast of Wichita on the outskirts of a little World War II housing project called Plainview. And a little cheap homes. Uh, in an economically depressed area, it's a very diverse area of uh, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and a uh, native, small Native American community. I was part of the Native American community. I'm a mix of several different things, and I always say that two of the things I think are relatively benign when I'm drinking, but the parts that seem to rise and surface pretty quickly are the Irish and Comanche parts. And... Uh, one or the other is going to take over the evening, and um, <clears throat> and I rarely have just a dull, ho-hum drinking episode. Usually there will be something will happen that will have some level of excitement to it before the evening's over. And, and um, I thought it was a good mix because I liked all the Irish uh, stuff. I liked the songs and the music. I just fell in love with the music, and I knew the Freedom songs and rebel songs and drinking songs, and I had all the albums by Clancy Brothers and Wolf Tones and Dubliners and all these folks. And, and so I would hit these places as I bounced around the country on layovers. Whether I knew where the Irish places were, whether I was in Boston or Chicago or Washington, D.C., and I'd go there, and I'd, I'd literally be the last one out the door, sitting there singing along to Wild Colonial Boy and all these songs that I loved. And... and uh, then other times, um, I'd be in another part of the country, and I'd never know which side's going to kick in, and the Comanche side would kick in. Maybe I'd have a few drinks and suddenly feel like going out and killing some white people. And uh, <laughs> wow. so sometimes, you know, if, I, if it happens to hit in Montana where all those wild cowboy bars are, that's not a good time. But um, <clears throat> anyway, I... Um, uh, when, when the alcohol hit the, hand, uh, hit the family, uh, I mean, when it really destroyed, just ripped through. I don't remember a beginning to it. I just remember all of a sudden it was there, and the family was just destroyed. Now, I was fortunate in that there was never any domestic abuse. My dad never beat my mom. I don't remember a lot of screaming and yelling. What I remember is a constant undercurrent of chaotic surprise. I never knew what was going to happen. I never knew what was going to happen. I could never bring friends home because I didn't know if my dad would be drunk or my mom would be drunk. And they embarrassed me when they were. They did things that were embarrassing, so I couldn't bring friends home. When I was 14, my parents divorced for the first time. <clears throat> and it was uh, it really hit me. I, I hadn't expected this. And uh, within the next three years, 
plus or minus shortly uh, that, that time frame. Each of them had been married and divorced two more times. And um, I had some problems. I remember basically as a kid I was either very happy and laughing or I was angry. And I didn't like step-parents and step-siblings, and so I got into a lot of fights with those folks. I don't remember any of them. Uh, I wouldn't know one of them if they walked into a room some night when I was there. Don't know who they are. But I would move to the other family for a little while, and then something would happen over there, and I would move back, and the faces and names would change because they were going pretty quickly. And so I kind of went through high school doing this. And... Uh, I was a good student when I applied myself, but nobody cared. And I, w I was completely on my own, and so was my sister. So I just goofed off in high school. I just missed a lot of academic opportunity because nobody cared. And I was doing what kids do, taking the easier, softer way. I was an athlete, probably average at best, although I thought I was pretty good. And um, when I graduated from high school, had decided I was going to join the service. And most of my friends, very few people from my area, went to college. And um, most of them married their little 18-year-old high school sweethearts. And Wichita has a lot of aircraft manufacturing. It's called the air capital of the world. They had Boeing, Beach, Cessna, and several others. And these young kids would get married and go to work for one of these air aircraft factories, and off they went into the sunset to begin their lives. But I was going to join the service and um, decided to join the Marine Corps. And uh, I was 18 by this time and went down, and one of my buddies had come back looking real good in a Marine uniform, and he and I had spent an afternoon and an evening in a bar, and I was listening to these stories, these wild, way out, just sadistic stories of what Marine drill instructors do to the recruits during 13 weeks of boot camp. I was just, just hanging on these words, and I guess it was an indication of early illness because I thought, man, I just can't wait to go do that. And uh, <laughs> so within a couple of days, within a couple of days, I'd found a Marine recruiter signed on the line and off I went. My story is a little bit different in several ways. First of all, I'm not going to do a <clears throat> big, long drunk log because I don't have time. I'm watching a timer here and uh, I don't have time for it. Um, I don't feel like i got to come up here and qualify myself for A or prove that I belong here. I hear people say that periodically. I paid a big price to get here, and I'm here and I'm staying. And so I'm not going to go through a litany of everything I did. I'm not going to talk about the blackouts, the fights, the lost cars, waking up where I didn't know where I was, trying to find my way back. I I'm going to skip a lot of that. Um, the other thing that I hear a lot of speakers talk about is that I never fit in, I never belong. That's not my story. Another thing that speakers quite often talk about, and I'm not putting any of this down, that's true for the people who come up and tell you, that's just not my story, is that I took that first magic drink and I knew that I had found what I wanted. I didn't like it at first. I liked the way it made me feel, but I had to work at it to, to really get there. But I've got a good work ethic, and um, so I'll stay with something until I get it. But uh, it took me a little while to actually get into the, to the alcoholism area. Once I got there, I did it well. Um, so I had gone into this Marine boot camp, um, and I found a home there. That's really where I wanted to be. Suddenly, once I adapted to the, the cultural change, I loved it. It was tough. It was structured. It was disciplined. I had never experienced anything like that before. Uh, it was extreme, and at the end of 13 weeks, the drill instructor called out three names out of 70. These are the three top guys, and my name was the second one called. And I had never done anything like that before. I wasn't trying to do that this time. I just simply wanted to survive each day and get through the experience. But I was extraordinarily proud. of. It. I was going to be a private first class, one strike. And I'll tell you, I just once I got it, I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I kept looking down and going, wow, private first class prowess. And all my buddies are slick sleeves, and I was moving up. And um, I remember going to Camp Pendleton after boot camp, and uh, it was raining, and we had guard duty, and because I had a PFC stripe, I, I was inside as acting corporal of the guard. All my buddies were outside walking in the rain, and I remember looking over the corner, there was a first lieutenant's uniform over there, and I remember looking at that, and I'm thinking, you know what, the rate I'm moving up, I'll bet general isn't too far away, and, uh, and so I was going to stay. I had found my home, and I would found my niche. 
I'm drinking, but I, I'm not drinking an awful lot at this point in time. Not a lot. Four and a half years later, I came walking in, and my commanding officer called me off the side, and he said, there's a new program out called Marine Aviation Cadet, and you're the only guy in the unit who's got an entry score that's high enough to qualify for you to go, qualify you to go there. But there are other tests that have to be taken, and if you're interested, you can pursue those. So I went over, and I spent a full day taking tests, and I passed them. And I went back, and he said, but I also have to tell you that there's going to be about a 50% washout rate and you are one of a very, very, very few who are going to come in the back door because you're an enlisted Marine. 98% or so are going to come in from the street civilian side, and they've got to have two years college minimum, and most of them are going to have more than that. And I'm thinking to myself, I can figure this out. I'm on the high end of probability and statistically of not making this because they're educated and I'm not, and this is going to be a fast, intense race. And I'm on the low end, probability-wise, of completing this. And I've always had a thing about failing. I just can't stand to fail. It's not anything my parents put on me. I don't know where it came from, but I've got it. And I thought about it, and I thought, but if I don't do this, I'll never fly. And I had always wanted to fly. But it wasn't on my life radar scope. Because I knew that the people who got to go do these things, pilots, came from wealthy families, well-educated families, um, people who had prestige and status and from a large, higher station in life than where I was coming from. And suddenly they were opening the door for me to go through it if I so chose. So I decided to do it, and I went home to Wichita, and they were having a powwow. I had been a dancer, always in the powwows and the songs. I went out and danced, and uh, they had a special for me because I was going to Pensacola honoring dance. And I left, and I thought all the way down to Pensacola, I was driving down there, I thought, you know, I can't come home as a failure, not to this community, because I'm the only one who has a chance to do this. Nobody else has this opportunity. And that if I'm successful, I'm going to get a set of gold wings right above my heart, and I'm going to get two gold bars. I'm going to be a commissioned Marine Corps officer. And that dream was almost too big for me to handle. So I went to uh, Pensacola, and I entered this program, 18-month program with four phases in it, intensively paced, extremely competitive, people washing out sometimes weekly, sometimes daily, and I'm watching it. I'm watching friends of mine come up to me with their sea bags over their shoulders, and sometimes, most of the time, their eyes down and averted because they're sad, maybe they're crying, but their dreams are over, they're not going to fly again, ever. And I'm thinking someday they will get me. Over the course of 18 months, they'll get me at some point. But throughout every one of those four phases, I always graduated as a number two guy. I never believed I was as good as my grades indicated. I never acquired any level of real confidence, never thought that I was really doing well. I always thought it was a mistake. And especially the first time, I thought they must have mixed up some papers and got the names on the wrong page. an administrative screw up. I'm not going to say anything about it. I'll leave it alone, but I just know that I don't belong there. Final six months, I went to, uh, left Florida, went to Beeville, Texas. I'm drinking. We're all drinking because we're going to be fighter pilots. Not only that, but Marine fighter pilots. And we don't drink like Army, Navy, Air Force pilots. We drink like Marine fighter pilots. So it's going to be a while before you can pull me out of the crowd. We're all doing it. But I'm managing my drinking because I've got something that I want to do. I have not entered that, that progressive area of the disease yet where I cannot manage my drinking. When I drink, I drink hard. But I quit on Saturday nights because I've got to study all day Sunday, and I'm going to, uh, I've got to be ready to go Monday. The first night I got into Beeville, Texas was a Friday. I reunited with a bunch of my buddies. We went to the officers' club and got drunk. It's a weekend. It's pre-Vietnam. We got weekends off. And they said, let's go into town. There's an old-fashioned drive-in called Cane's, and that's where the good-looking girls hang out. And I said, okay. And I was never really aggressive or gutsy with the girls, but I'd had enough to drink. I thought I can, I can go along with them. So we went in there, and they immediately went after a carload of girls. And I thought, I better have a few more. So I'm standing in the back, and I'm drinking, and I don't know about you, but the more I drink, the sharper I get, the more intelligent, the quippier, the taller, the better looking, the more fearless. And so I've got about three or four things rehearsed 
that uh, I notice the driver of the car is not saying anything to anybody. So I'm, I've got these things kind of churning around. I'm going, these are just knock her socks off things that I've got ready to go. So I'm ready to go. So I go up there, and she turns and looks at me, and she's uh, really good looking. And uh, and I forgot everything I was going to say. And uh, and now I'm standing there, with, uh, and she's looking at me. I know she expects me to say something. And... Uh, so what I thought I said was um, the only thing that came to mind is I'm looking at her, I'm going, you've got the most beautiful brown eyes I've ever seen, which isn't the sharpest thing that some guy could come up with, but I accept it came out like, <laughs> and she looks at me with this look, and um, I thought, you know, I could have stood there and just peed on the side of her car, and she would have looked at me the same way. You know? <laughs> And so I turned around and walked off. I just left. I, I, you know, I don't think there's anything worse than being so drunk that you can't talk and yet you, you still know you're embarrassed. And, <laughs> and, and I turned around and walked off and I thought, I'm just not going back. And, um, so I'm standing back there drinking. And a little while later, she got out of the car to go into the ladies' room and I could see her real well. And, um, uh, I had an AA thought um, at that moment, although I didn't know it. I wouldn't recognize it for about 29 more years. But I'm watching her going this place, and I'm looking her over, and I'm going, man, turquoise shorts, she's got a really cute butt, nice legs, and brown eyes, way more than I had on a list. And uh, I thought, you know, I want what she has, and I'm willing to go to any lengths to get it. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. You know, I, I, I've got an Indian buddy of mine that talks about this list that we have for our prospective mates. He said, you know, when we first start drinking, he said, we've got a page-long list of all the things they're going to have to have. That are, These are our demands. They're going to have to meet these or we're not going to consider them. And he said, by the time we're through drinking, he said, we'll settle for somebody who's got a full set of teeth and a job. <laughs> <clears throat> He's also the same guy who said, in the, in the States, we have two, two driving offenses, DUI, driving under the influence, and DWI, driving while intoxicated. Depends on what state you're in as how they phrase it. But he said he was in court for the seventh time before he found out that DWI did not stand for drinking with Indians. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I had an accidental encounter with the girl that was in driving, and I saw her girlfriend going to place, and I had a cadet buddy and went in and um, uh, feigned surprise. I was a little scared and nervous, but I was sober. And bought him some coffee, and they, she finally gave me her name and said I could call her. And uh, on February the 25th, 1963, which was her 20th birthday, she told me I could tell you that. She pinned my wings and gold bars on me, and it was a day, I mean, it was an amazing day. Hollywood couldn't have scripted a better day. It was just great. I, everything. Had my wings, had my gold bars. This thing was over. I had a good looking girl. We went home to Kansas and three weeks later we ran off to Oklahoma. We were on leave. And as the leave was getting ready to close, I said, let's go to Oklahoma. We ran down, stood in front of a justice of peace and got married. Borrowed rings from these two people that went with us. They're divorced. Um, and we've been married for 46 years. Went to, I went to uh, California and joined a terrific Marine squadron out there. I'm really drinking heavy now. I'm starting because that's what I'm supposed to do. Wrecked the car the first two Friday nights that she was out there for happy hour. Said, I don't give me any crap. I'm going to happy hour. It's just not a big deal. Nobody got hurt. The car wasn't damaged too badly. But indications were starting. But I, you know, it was no big deal. It just wasn't a big deal. Could happen to anybody. That was an argument for a long time. I got into treatment. I started making all these lists out. I'm going, well, all of these things could happen to everybody, but all of them couldn't happen to one person. And uh, at any rate, we um, immediately had a, a little baby boy instantly. Uh, eight, eight days less than a year later, we had a second one. And uh, people kept coming up going, are you guys Catholic? <laughs> and, I, and pretty soon I'm thinking, what the heck, you know, they think you've got to be a Catholic to do this? And I'd just say, no, we're just a couple of horny Protestants, and um, yeah, it's not, not a big deal. Anyway, off I go to Vietnam, and I um, was over there for a while and acquitted myself well. We were one of the first Marine squadrons over there. Had a good reputation. I was used to having a good reputation. That's what I was supposed to have, and that's what I worked towards. Everything I did, I was supposed to reflect honor, pride, and dignity on things. I wasn't supposed to bring shame and disgrace to anything. 
And I taught my kids things like duty, honor, country, character, honesty, integrity. So when this arrest thing happened, I had real trouble, real problems with the shame. But um, flew a lot of missions over there and picked up some personal decorations, came home, and uh, finally decided to get out of the Marine Corps because I was going to spend four to six years away from my family, my kids, if I stayed and did what I wanted to do. And it was a painful decision. I sat down and I wrote the letter. Barbara had never pressured me to do that. I, I just said, I promised her that we were going to have a good family. She had met my family, and she knew about my family. I said, we'll never have one like that. We're going to have a good family. And so I resigned and got out of the Marine Corps. I'd been in there for 11 and a half years. Had gone in as a barely 18-year-old private, came out as a well-decorated, well-thought-of captain, Marine jet fighter pilot. I had had a good journey through that 11 and a half years. I had gone from the bottom towards the top, and there were some extraordinary accomplishments in there. And I, I believed that's what I was supposed to do. Never thought I'd be an alcoholic. Went with the airlines, and for nearly 22 years, the airlines had almost the same reputation. Right after we got to the airlines, we had talked about adopting a child even before we got married. We had these two boys, and Barbara thought she'd like a daughter. I thought a daughter would be great. So we adopted a little Indian girl, and it was a tough struggle because of the fact that we already had the two biological boys, but we fought it through for 14 months. And we get a little girl, most beautiful little girl I've ever seen. And she came to our house when she was 17 days old. Drove over and got her, and uh, she became our daughter. And that little girl, uh, while she was Barbara's daughter, I found out quickly what daughters do to their dads. And she instantly became the center of my universe. And uh, most beautiful little thing I've ever seen. And uh, we named her Dawn. And she couldn't walk past me without me reaching out and hugging her or telling her, come over here, I want to hug. And I'd hug her and I'd look in that face and I'd say, thanks for being my girl. And she'd say, thanks for being my dad. And when that little girl was 17 years old, she ran away from home. And I didn't see it coming. Barbara didn't see it coming. I don't lay everything at the doorstep of alcoholism. I just simply don't know. One of the problems I had about being an alcoholic was I didn't drink every night. I rarely ever drank in the mornings, and I just knew all you guys drank in the mornings. Um, I didn't get drunk every weekend, I would, but I would deliberately vary my drinking patterns. Most normal drinkers don't find that necessary, but I would change my drinking patterns, and I couldn't stay drunk for three weeks like I just knew all of you did. Um, I didn't beat or abuse my wife or kids physically. I could get pretty verbally abusive. Um, I was at the top of my game. I was an airline captain. I wasn't having any trouble with prefer, uh, check rides. I wasn't getting divorces. I did get two DUIs that were separated by six years, and each one of those, of course, was just a fluke accident. should never have happened. Uh, and so I didn't see any of that as an indication. But... <clears throat> Dawn ran away from home. I'd gone to Chicago to take a special written test. I, did, I was going to be a captain. She was coming up on graduation. I'd passed it up for two years because I wanted to be home with her, which was quite a sacrifice on my part, which gave me a heck of a basis for a lot of martyrdom and self-pity a little later on. But um, uh, I, I was calling to come home from Chicago, and Barbara, I, Barbara, I knew something was wrong. Barbara said Dawn ran away last night. When she took me to the airport the afternoon before, Dawn had come in with a couple of her friends and taken what she wanted and left a note that Barbara didn't find until late at night. And I panicked and blurted out where to go and who to call and where to look and got on the airplane, and two hours later I was back in Atlanta. And I don't know where on that airplane ride certain things happened, I, I don't, but somewhere, somehow, some way, everything changed for me. And when I got home, by the time we landed, I hated her. I, I hated her worse than I thought I could hate anyone or anything on the face of this planet. I absolutely hated this girl for what she had done to me. And I announced to Barbara when I walk out and get in the car, under no circumstances will she ever be allowed to come home. I don't care if she dies in the ditch or the streets. She will not come home. Not only that, I never want her name mentioned to me, ever, as long as I'm alive, never in my presence. Within two days, I had taken all of her furniture and everything had gone to Goodwill, which is a uh, charity organization. Uh, everything she'd ever touched in that house was gone. 
finest detective, couldn't have found any evidence that she'd ever been in my home. I went to an attorney and gave him $500 and disowned her. I tried to annul the adoption, and I couldn't. And as I was going through all of this stuff, in a manner that I usually say can only appear insanely amusing, I thought, you know, my poor wife is having some problems dealing with this, and she needs a therapist. (laughs) I was so benevolent. So because Barbara was struggling, and I was doing just fine with it, uh, I plucked the name of this guy out of the phone book, and by the luck of the draw, got a good therapist, Ph.D., family therapist, and we saw him for about two years, two times a month. And um, he, I, what I find interesting is he never asked us about drinking. Now, I didn't have a problem talking about it. I wasn't trying to hide it or steer the conversation away from it. I didn't have a problem with it. I'll talk about it if you want to talk about it. But it never came up. And I'm, I'm just amazed by that. What I do remember, uh, you know, I, I would go to these sessions, and I didn't like talking about my daughter. And I remember one time a subject came up, and I made a comment that I had never formulated in my mind. I had never had this conscious thought. But he said something to me about my daughter, and I said, I, it was very close. He's as close as Charles here is to me. And I looked at him, and I said, I'm going to tell you something, doctor. I said, I would rather hate than hurt. And that's how I did it. And he said to me, he said, every time you had a shift in your family, every time you went through something like that, that's what you did, and it worked for you then, but if you continue, it'll destroy you. And I looked at him, and I didn't make a comment, but I'll bet he could read my mind, because I'm thinking, well, you may be a Ph.D. family therapist, but I'm an airline pilot, (laughs) and I'll do it my way. And he was right. He was right about everything he told us over the course of those two years. He never told us one thing that didn't prove out to be true. He also said every time you've experienced that, what we were feeling was abandonment and betrayal. And I had never labeled any of that, and I thought that's exactly what I was feeling. That's exactly what I thought. Never tried to label any of that or figure it out. But the minute he said that, I thought, bingo, right on target. And he said, now comes this daughter who you love more than anything, and she does it. And he said, it's going to take an awful lot of hate to cover that, and I thought, I'll do the work. I'll do the work. So Barbara had asked me not to drink at home anymore because even though I'd said don't mention her name, I would mention her name. And out would fly all these filthy, vile things about this girl, none of which were true. But they just killed Barbara, and she couldn't stand to hear that. And I said, I don't have to drink at home. I'll drink when I'm out. And so I would lock myself in a hotel room, and I'd get a quart of booze, and I would sit in there, and I would drink. And I would think about this girl. And I could never get the relief I wanted. What I wanted was that warm, easy, floating, I don't care feeling. I know how that feels. And I get it quick because I mix strong drinks. And before the second hand of that clock goes around, I've got it. I've got it feeling going through me. Warm, I just don't care. I couldn't, I never once ever got that. What I got had the effect of pouring gasoline on a fire. Because when I drank, I hated her worse. And I hated her worse. You know, we talk about resentments. Every, every time it goes through, you refeel it. And every time you refeel it, her role is bigger, mine is smaller. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I hated her, and I hated her, and I just kept drinking, and I just, I just, this hatred just got white hot. So I never got any relief from the drinking. But it was nothing for me to sit down and go through a quart of alcohol by myself. Nothing. That's where we were pretty much when the arrest took place. That was the state of our lives when the arrest took place. And I went into this treatment center, and it was one of the best places I could ever have gone. It was the place I never wanted to be, and I didn't know what it was going to be like. I remember driving down the hill thinking, what's it going to be like? And the only thing I got was we had a movie over in America called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the Jack Nicholson in this nutsy place, and that's what I was visualizing. It was nothing like that. Anybody that's been to treatment knows what I'm talking about. I went into this place, and I was so ashamed. It was a a week before anybody knew the color of my eyes. I could not look up, would not look up. And uh, I didn't want anybody to talk to me. I didn't want anybody to know who I was or what I was. And quickly the media had it, and now everybody knew. The second morning in treatment, you know, some things happen that aren't funny then, but they're funny later. And uh, that's what I like about this recovery. Uh, but the second morning in treatment, it was a Saturday. It was a weekend routine. I didn't know a weekend routine from the week routine, but it was relaxed. I walked outside in the same clothes I'd gone into, and I sat in a chair, 
in a recreation area at the back by myself. I didn't want to be with anybody. Off to the left, I knew somebody was sitting in a chair about three feet away there. We were at an, um, uh, the treatment center was two and a half miles from the Atlanta airport and an airplane had taken off and I watched it and I started, I'm thinking I'll never see the cockpit again. I got sick, started to choke. I was swallowing it and I turned around. That's when I went over and sat down in this chair and I'm sitting there by myself and uh, there's this voice that comes from the left. He says, you know, if I only had a month to live, this is where I'd want to be. And I don't know if there's somebody on the other side of him. I don't know who he's talking to. If he's talking to the trees, the rocks, or me, or who. And, and I'm thinking, you know, I've only had one night here, but I haven't quite reached that point. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and I, didn't, I, I didn't want to talk to him, but I just uh, suddenly said, uh, really? And uh, this voice comes back and says, yeah, because every goddamn day here seems like a month. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's his version of one day at a time, I guess. And I... I didn't look, and I never, never knew who it was by the time I left that treatment center. But I had a lot of intense experiences in there. And, and um, a week to the day that I'd gone in, there were two TVs. I wouldn't go near either one of them. They had announced on TV that Northwest Airlines had terminated me, as they should have, that the FAA had issued an emergency revocation of all my flight certificates, and they should have done that. And I'd lost my FAA medical certificate because of my diagnosis of alcoholism, and that was fair to I'm a hardcore believer in acceptance of personal responsibility. There's nobody in this program who has a level of recovery that I admire and want who believes they're a victim. That's a matter of my choice, and I'm not a victim of anything. Everything that happened to me was appropriate and fair. I believe when you do what you did, you get what you got, and that was a fair deal. It was hard, but it was fair. Um, then I walked into a group therapy session that first week, and for me to talk is counterintuitive. I just sit and look. And I began to talk. They closed the door, and for some reason or other, I began to talk about my daughter, and I broke down and cried. I've never cried at my parents' funerals. It's not okay for me to cry. I grew up that way, especially Indian people don't cry. And I broke down and cried about my daughter. I sobbed. The first time ever I took the pain exactly the way I was supposed to, and that was head on. And there was nothing blocking it, and I, saw, I sobbed. And then I was so ashamed and so embarrassed and felt like I was naked. But it was one of the most important things that happened to me in treatment because I learned I had nothing to do with how tough I am or how tough I'm not. And it lanced that poisonous, horrible boil inside of me and let it to start to come out. And within a day or two, I wrote to Barbara and I said, get a hold of Dawn, let's put the family back together again. There were no visitors and no phone calls in this place. But when they learned about this, they said, that's such an impossible breakthrough for you. We'll give you a day room if you can make that happen. The two doctors heard about this and asked if they could please come watch. The family therapist had put in his notes, his family will never reconcile because of me. He said, I don't know what happened to you. But he said, I want to see that. So on an afternoon, a short while later, I walked into a, tree, into a day room. And, and I opened the door and I saw the two doctors off to the left. And there was my daughter. And I'd forgotten that she was that small. And I walked over. I can't tell you what it felt like to put my arms around her and hug her and tell her how much I loved her instead of how much I hated her. And I looked down in her arms, and there was a five-month-old granddaughter that I didn't know anything about. Barbara had mentioned it, and I just didn't, I didn't want to hear about it. And I picked the little granddaughter up. She took my heart as fast as my daughter had. I'm in the first week of treatment, and I'm already seeing promises come true. And we've healed that relationship. My daughter is my little girl again. Shortly thereafter, we start getting word of legal consequences. Now, nobody knew about legal consequences. I knew there was going to be a action. I knew Northwest was going to terminate me. But none of the lawyers that were involved the day of the arrest, either company or airline, knew anything about a legal offense. And at first began, I went through six of them, beginning first with Minnesota, then with North Dakota, then they were doubling the offenses, and they were taking me out every two to three days to tell me this, and it was killing me. I'd never been in jail. The only time I thought I'd be in jail was as a POW in Vietnam if I was shot down. And finally, they take me out the last time, and there's a doctor standing there, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And they said, they took me down to the doctor's office and said, I want you to sit down. He said, we've just learned that the federal government a United States grand jury has just indicted you on a, on a new rule that was put in place several years ago. Nobody's ever been tried under it. But you're looking at 15 years in federal prison, a $250,000 fine, 
And an attorney's coming in Sunday and wants $50,000, which I didn't have. We went broke in the thir first 30 days after the arrest. We lost it all. And he said, I have to ask if you're going to hurt yourself. And I said, no, no. I went back to my room and I collapsed. I do not remember falling. I remember lying on the carpet and I was crying again, lying right next to the carpet. And I said, God, I can't do this anymore, please. I said, not even one more time. I can't do it anymore. I, I, I just don't have anything left. Please help me. And I remember sleeping that night. I had an amazing uh, experience throughout the entire treatment things. Many, many things happened to me, that, and I worked hard in there. I, the thing was, I didn't know. They were talking about 12 steps in this program, and I didn't know if there was anything of this or not. But I didn't have anything left to bet on. I knew that everything I knew had brought me there, and I had nothing to bet on, and I was hoping against hope that there was something to this. And so I invested in it. And I think I probably worked as hard in that 28 days to get sober as I did to get my wings. I did exercises in the workbook nobody ever did. I didn't go near the TV sets. I was always reading or I was working. And I got out of treatment. I came back up, and I was immediately indicted in front of TV cameras in Minnesota everywhere we went. I wish I had time to tell you a story about my attorney because nobody's, nobody I know of has ever had an experience with an attorney like I had. At least I haven't heard of it, but I haven't got time for that. But at any rate, everywhere we went, they had all the avenues of approach blocked. There were reporters and cameras, and they're sticking microphones and cameras in my face. And what I would do is, and I was terrified, as I start to the door, and there they were, and I would mantra the serenity prayer over and over and over and over until I could feel something begin to grab hold inside, just begin to let loosen up. didn't go away, but I could feel it grab hold. And I'd get, go through them and get in there. And we went through a very horrendously publicized uh, trial. I'm looking at the TV. There's my picture. There are the sketches. There's everything I never thought of. I always thought that happened to other people. It didn't happen to me. And there I am. And um, I had an advantage over the other two guys, though, because I was the only alcoholic. It was all over the headlines, the pages. So when you guys decide you want to talk about anonymity, I just slide my chair back. I got nothing to say about it. I never had any. But um, they all know I'm an alcoholic, and I'm going to AA meetings at night. And at first it's scary because I walk in, and they recognize me. And it takes me a few minutes to settle. I understand I'm in a safe place. This is safe for me. I never shared. I just sat and listened. And I took the energy that you had and directed my way, and I took it to the courtroom the next day. Criminal trial is indescribable, indescribable. And they're painting me there as the most worthless piece of crap on the entire face of the earth. And sometimes I would look across the courtroom at Barbara. Our eyes would meet, and she would mouth the words, I love you. And I would nod, and I'd be okay. I'd get through the rest of the day. We were quickly found guilty, as I knew we would be. When we, they announced the sentence, I told my attorney, I said, we'll be found guilty. So, I know you're doing the best you can. Don't worry about it. He stiffened, and I reached over and patted him. I said, it's okay, Peter. It's all right. Went back for the sentencing, and uh, the judge had leaked it to the press and to the other two attorneys, notified the other two attorneys, an hour, a day and a half before the sentencing, and he was going to depart upward from the sentencing guidelines. Guidelines were in place at, the, at that time. They've been lifted since then. The guidelines were 12 months to 18 months. And I was the captain, and I was going to get 18 months. And my lawyer said, he can go all the way to 15 years now. And the judge had strong feelings about this case, and I saw him every day for three weeks. I sat there, and I looked at that judge, and I read that judge, and I didn't have any trouble understanding how he felt. And he had a right to feel that way. It was a horrific betrayal of the public trust. He was entitled to those feelings. The prosecutor hadn't asked him to in increase the sentence. The judge wanted to do this. So I told Barbara, I said, this is going to be heavy. I said, this is the first step all over again. I'm powerless over what's going to happen. I've got to do, I, all I've got to do, I've got to accept what's coming. I was in treatment with a, a federal judge, and he said, let me tell you, the sentencing is, is a charade. He said, even though you're going to talk, your attorney's going to talk, maybe you'll have witnesses. The sentence is set. He said, it never changes. When we come through the courtroom, that sentence stays in place. The sentencing is a charade. So I knew. And... Um, all I could, I was the first to stand and talk, and I, I couldn't been, I was so scared I couldn't compose anything. I thought, just let me speak from the heart. And I talked about being grateful to be sober, grateful for the things that happened inside my family, 
and that I had accepted responsibility from day one and, and I couldn't change what happened yesterday. And the judge, to everybody's surprise, announced a sentence on me of 16 months, two months less under the guidelines. Blew everybody away, including me. And uh, <clears throat> 12 months to the other two guys. Then he did something that, um, oh, that nobody thought he would do. I told uh, Barbara, I said, well, he'll have us well let away in handcuffs, and I'd given all my personal effects to her. And he said, this is the first of its case, uh, kind case. He said, this law has never been used before. It wasn't designed for airline pilots. I know there will be appeals. You three gentlemen can remain free until your appeals are exhausted. And the other two opted for it, and I said, no, I'll go to prison, prison now. It's time for me to go. Prison was mandatory. There was no suspension or probation. So I said, I've been found guilty. I'll go now. Because in here I'd learn I deal with life on life's terms. I don't whistle in the dark and hope it goes away. I told my kids, I said, the reality is I can't come out the back door till I go in the front. And then he said, uh, he told my lawyer later, he said, no, no defendant's ever done that. He said, at first, he said, I, I was lost for words. I said, well, he wasn't lost very long. Um, so on December the 5th, 1990, I went into prison in the Atlanta prison system uh, to serve 16 months. I served 424 days in there, one time, one day at a time when, when shorter and uh, when necessary. I don't talk about prison from the podium. Uh, it hasn't got anything to do with recovery. Recovery has everything to do with how I dealt with prison. I just simply don't talk about it. I had a lot of experiences in there. One time I'd spoken and some guy came up to me afterwards. He said, 424 days. <laughs> he said, hey, man, he said, I was out there 18 years. I looked at him, smiled, and said, hey, well, you win. And um, it was a long time for me. It was a long time for me. I came out of there. I was broke. I was never to fly again. The judge... What I forgot to tell you was the judge had put sanctions on me to make sure, on top of the FAA stuff, that I never flew again, ever. About a year later, in another miracle, the judge lifted those sanctions. The FAA then told me, they said, if you want to fly again, you'll start again with a private license. I'd never had one, and nobody thought it was possible. None of my pilot buddies thought it was possible to literally start from the ground up and do it. But I'd learned in here one day at a time, one thing at a time. So I went after it that way, changed my attitude about it. Ten and a half months later, I had four licenses. But there's a flying part that goes with those licenses. And this was an extraordinary amount of work. And uh, <clears throat> I said, that we can't do it. We were broke. We were just barely staying alive. I was working in the treatment center. I was making $14,000 a year, just barely staying alive. One of the pilots said to me, I want you to come up here and live with me and go through the flight school free. I went up there and spent 30 days in the summer of 93, I was actually there 44 days. We were rained out 14 days. In the remaining 30 days, I flew 78 hours, and I got four licenses back, two of them one day by 11.15 in the morning. I don't think that had ever been done before. I came back with four licenses, and I thought, well, that's great, but who's going to hire me? I was the most notorious pariah in all of commercial aviation. Never, never going to, Nobody would hire me. And about, I think it was a month later, and the licenses actually came in the mail. I got a phone call from the head of the pilot union. I had never fought my termination. There had been a grievance had been automatically filed. And I said, I'm not going to fight it. They were justified in firing me. They didn't fire me for being an alcoholic. They fired me for what I did. And that was fair. He said, that's the best phone call I've ever made because he said, three hours ago, the president of Northwest Airlines notified me that you are coming back to Northwest to full flight status. This was an airline I had so horribly shamed and disgraced. The comics had made fun of Northwest Airlines for months on end and the president of the airline was going to bring me back. And I sat there, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and the tears came again. It was the most extraordinary miracle I thought I would ever experience again. So I went back to Northwest Airlines, went through the return process, and they said, met, met with the president of the airlines, became friends with the president of the airlines. I was never supposed to be a captain again. I said, I don't care. I've been a captain. I just can't believe that I'm coming back. I'm going to fly again. I'm going to get some kind of retirement out of this was overwhelmingly welcome back. Some people don't want you to come back, but that's just the way it is. All I did was stay sober. Northwest now had a program, and I was part of it. The fir first time ever they'd had a program, and I get to be part of it. As I stayed sober and just tried to do the best job possible for the airlines, I was certainly the most visible alcoholic on the property. I came up to the last year and was speaking at United Airlines. Barbara was with me. I got a phone call late at night, and they woke me up again and said, when you come back, John Dasberg, the president of Northwest Airlines, wants you to be a captain for the final year that you're here. 
I went back and I checked out and I finished in the left seat of a 747, fully restored, giving back all my trust as a 747 captain, the most notorious alcoholic in all of American aviation. And that's what happens when I get sober. I retired honorably at the mandatory retirement age of 60 in September of 98, having vindicated, I think, everybody who took such a horrible risk on me and took a chance. They took an incredible chance based on the 70% relapse rate that most of us have. And the CEO would have lost his career if I had failed. And I can't, still can't believe he did that. And within days of leaving and retiring from Northwest, I get a phone call. My attorney says, Judge Rosenbaum, who was the toughest judge in the entire district, said in, there, in 16 years he has never supported a petition for pardon, but if you want to make the attempt, he'll support yours. He wrote a, an affidavit that is so powerful that I've never been able to read it without tearing up, and I've read it 30 times at least. I sent the paperwork in, and two years later, I received a presidential pardon. An incredible thing, just an incredible life-altering event. The second day I was in treatment, I remember I listened to the promises. I perked up a little bit. My head was down, but I was listening. And then I got to that part that says, no matter how far down the scale we've gone, we'll see our experience can benefit others. And I thought, no. No, that may be true for you, but that's not going to happen for me. Can't. I'm going way too far down. I've had this amazing story, and I haven't even told you about most of the miracles. I've run over on time. I just want to thank you for having me here. Thank you for letting me be a guest in your country and for the warm, gracious, wonderful hospitality we've had. And on behalf of Barbara and I, uh, we will take away a lot of love and a lot of great memories. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.